Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Washington Lane University School of Law. My name is Chuck Gates. I am the managing editor of the Journal of Energy, Climate, and the Environment. <clears throat> you have to excuse me, my daughters have started to pass on a little bit of a cold to me today. Um, I wanted to take a, a brief moment to introduce, um, to introduce our dean and to welcome you all today here. Welcome to those of you who are participating via the webcast. Um, it should be live. For those of you who are here in the room, the webcast will be available on our website um, for the coming months, um, and you can access it there. It should be there um, at least until we have another, the next year's symposium to replace it. Uh, and then I'm sure we'll archive it so that everyone can access it. Um, on behalf of the Environmental Law Society, which is a co-sponsor with our journal, I'd like to welcome you all. Um, I'd like to recognize Lena uh, Delze Guzman, who is here. Close. close, very close. Lena is a good friend, and she's the president of the Environmental Law Society, so we thank her for her support. Uh, I also like to thank um, our editor in chief, who is Jonas Callis, who's over here. Jonas, if you could wave. He's the editor in chief of the journal, and uh, we thank him for his leadership and support today. Finally, I'd like to uh, thank Jennifer Lynn, who is the Managing Events Editor for the Journal, who has coordinated everything today, um, and thank her for her support. Most of all, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the next two people for their support. Um, first of all is Professor Hari Osofsky, who the Dean will introduce a little bit more, but Professor Osofsky is new to Washington Lee this year, and we welcome her with open arms. We're so grateful that she's here. She's been such a great addition to us, and the Dean will tell you a little bit more uh, as he introduces her. and. Uh, and her role. Um, and now for our, our esteemed dean. Uh, Rod Smollett is the dean, and Roy L. Steinheimer, Jr., professor of the Washington and Lee University School of Law. He uh, graduated from Yale University and Duke Law School, but he's told me that he doesn't like a long introduction. I will tell you, he came to us. He's, this is now his third year here? Second year here, man. It's, he's done so much. He's done so much that time has flown. Um, and he comes to us from the University of Richmond School of Law. And we are so grateful. The support he's given us this year and our inaugural year of the journal has been terrific. And so uh, without further ado, I, I welcome uh, Dean Rodney Small. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Chuck, and congratulations to uh, Chuck and Jonas and Jennifer and Lena. Uh, this is a wonderful first uh, uh, project for the new journal. This is its inaugural year uh, in its new transformed uh, form, and it's a wonderful project for the Environmental Law Society. The topic that all of you will be discussing throughout the day, uh, climate change and energy a policy uh, under the new uh, Obama administration is being duplicated and triplicated and multiplicated uh, in forums like this today around the country on virtually every topic facing the nation. And so I'm sure somewhere in Chicago there are five or six conferences now uh, dealing with whatever industry or social problem or issue you can imagine. Uh, issues facing public schools in the new Obama administration, tax policy in the new Obama administration, communications policy in the new Obama administration, and so on. And yours today is, of course, of a magnitude uh, that is difficult uh, to match. There are probably few issues facing humanity as significant as the future of the, of the Earth as a viable uh, environmental ent entity. There are few issues of greater intensity and significance to us uh, than how that intersects with the world's need for energy. Uh, and so that comes at a time in which the entire country is in the deepest crisis that most of us who are in the room today have lived through. Those of us that have lived through Vietnam and the civil rights era and all of the upheavals, political, social, and economic uh, during our lifetimes, only heard from our parents or our grandparents about uh, the Depression and about World War II. And there is a sense of unreality to most of us right now about these issues. You come to an idyllic place like Lexington, most of us live in the world of higher education, a world largely sheltered in any immediate sense from many of the disruptions and dislocations that face other parts of the 
economy and the social sector. And it's hard in a way to feel that it's real. Uh, enclaves like higher education, though not entirely recession proof, are to some degree recession retardant. And so you may have seen that yesterday Harvard announced plans for how it will deal with the some, something like $10 billion loss of its endowment. Uh, Duke has lost over a billion dollars in its endowment and has to make budgetary decisions. Here at Washington and Lee, we're making cuts in a, many of our operating expenses to try to preserve money for financial aid. We have colleagues at Virginia Tech or William and Mary or the University of Utah dealing with state budgets and figuring out how they're going to uh, operate at the levels they've been operating at. But these are on the margins for us in higher education. These are uh, working with 5% less or 10% less or dealing with job freezes or, or maybe a slowdown in building a new building on your campus. But as we all know, in many, many, many other parts of the sector of this, of this country and around the world, it's not like that at all. It's much, much, much worse. So what we have to give back in this protected world that we live in is our best intelligence, our best thinking, our best ability to help those who are now in charge, to help those who are now leading the country make the best decisions they can possibly make. Uh, we know that climate that addressing the issues of climate change will be a priority for the new administration. And we know that's got to be balanced against the hundreds of other pressing things that the new administration has got to contend with. The hope, for those of us in higher education, the hope is that good things come out of the kinds of thought processes that you all will be engaged in today. Uh, that there will be constructive things, positive things, cross-examination of one another, uh, a true working of the marketplace of ideas in a way that actually translates into something of constructive value in guiding those who will take these ideas and turn them into policy. Thanks once again to the students for your leadership. Uh, I was delighted that the students who inherited a somewhat moribund uh, journal that dealt with these issues had the uh, leadership ability to reconceive of it uh, and give it a new identity, and this is a wonderful start for them. And I'm delighted with the Environmental Law Society for engaging our students in things that matter. One of the reasons that they were emboldened to do that is we were fortunate last year to hire a new colleague, Hari Asoski, who you'll hear from in a moment. Uh, when young colleagues come to a new law faculty, one of the things you hope for is that they'll understand that the life of a law professor ought to be a lot more than writing articles in law reviews and teaching classes, uh, that it ought to involve a sense of participation in the life of the university and the law school and the society around us. And Hari is an exemplar of that. She is a person who came uh, to Washington and Lee uh, with enormous exuberance and energy and creativity. Uh, she is both a dean's blessing and headache because when <laughs> Hari comes into my office, I always know there'll be some new idea and that there could be money involved. Uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, but she's also the kind of person who you want to invest in because you know that uh, it's a kind of stimulus package. If you invest in people with the leadership that she brings uh, and the energy and creativity that she brings, she'll spread that and that will be infectious and that will spread to students and to fellow faculty members and good things will happen like this symposium. And so I'm delighted uh, to invite her as our sort of official academic host and intellectual leader for the day. Uh, I am going to be missing a lot of the day, unfortunately. Um, Hopefully we'll be back later in the afternoon and be able to reconnect and, and debrief with you if I can. So welcome again uh, to Washington and Lee, and please join me in welcoming uh, our colleague, Hari Osalski. Hari. So thank you, Rod, for that, uh, that, that warm welcome and, uh, and, and for your remarks. Um, it's a tremendous honor and pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce this dialogue today. And before I do so, we have so many thanks to give to those who made this inaugural Environmental Law Symposium possible here. Um, we tremendously appreciate, first of all, the support of numerous people in the law school and the broader community. Um, in the law school, Dean Rod Smola, who you just heard for, from, together with Associate Deans Bob Danforth, John Keyser, and Sidney Evans, 
sorry, Sydney, uh, the Director of Communications, Pete Chaton, Executive Assistant to the Dean, Carol Shorter, and the support of staff and faculty services, especially Diane Cochran, who tracked down a cell phone for us last night, um, Wendy Rice, who was blasting a, a thing to the community this morning, making sure that, that people remembered to come, Brianne Kleinart and Elizabeth Christensen. All, all of these, these, these people in the law school have provided us with critical financial, conceptual, and logistical support without which this day really could not have happened. Um, and I wanted to, to especially note the hard work that Director of Instructional Media Services, Tom Williams, um, had to put in. Um, he gave us invaluable assistance in our experiment that we're doing today in remote participation. More broadly, we're lucky to be in a university community making serious strides on issues of sustainability in general and climate change in particular. I actually see a number of members of the University Sustainability Committee in the room and a number of them are participating today. Um, President Ruscio signed the American College and University President's Climate Commitment almost two years ago and the participation of scholars from so many departments in today's event reflects this school's interdisciplinary engagement with the problem of climate change. We also are excited to be surrounded by leading experts from the region and around the country working on this issue and about this as a first step in developing a regional interdisciplinary coalition on climate change. Um, and we'd like to give a special thank you to our presenters and moderators, particularly Marcelin Burke, who we'll see a little later today, she woke up sick this morning, who's, who agreed to come even though it's her birthday. Um, last, but certainly not least, um, I, I really want to give special um, thanks and recognition to the students who are involved with the Journal of Energy, Climate and the Environment and the Environmental Law Society. They put a tremendous amount of work, thought and care into making today happen. Um, I, I, I have help, I've, I've helped students organize these things many times over the years and I have to tell you, I have never seen a more organized group of students. It's really been phenomenal. Um, I particularly want to recognize, um, though she's already been recognized, the journal managing events editor Jennifer Lynn, who's really taken a lead in organizing all of the logistics from, you know, I, I checked in with her at one point yesterday and she had been calling each of the students who was picking up people at the airport to make sure they were all connecting perfectly. Um, uh, you know, but she has, from, from advertising this event to making sure that, um, you know, everything, I mean, every detail that you're seeing around you, um, you know, Jennifer has been um, on top of. I also want to recognize journal managing editor Chuck Gates, who let us off today. Um, he's worked with media services and our panelists to make this remote participation possible and really done a phenomenal job of pushing the technology forward um, here in, 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 in this. And also, um, he, he helped arrange childcare for one of our participants. Um, journal executive editor and Environmental Law Society Vice President Megan Williams, who worked with Cynthia Lawson in, universe, in the University Publications Office to create our conference materials, such as this um, image you're seeing behind us. Um, and then finally, um, last but not least, I want to recognize the, the leaders of the two organizations who are co-sponsoring this, um, Editor-in-Chief uh, Jonas Callis and Environmental Law Society President um, Lena Golza Desmond um, for their able leadership. Um, I, I have to also just say I've really been enjoying uh, the cooperative relationship with the journal and with the Environmental Law Society students and the wonderful work that they've put into launching this journal and the symposium. You know, my, I basically arrived here to them trying to develop bylaws for this, this new venture. Um, and we've gone from there to, to this event. So I know that this is just going to be the beginning of many of exci such exciting symposiums here at Washington and Lee um, in our environmental program. So now to the substance. The election of President Obama in tandem with a changed congressional composition has created a moment of renewed engagement with the problem of climate change in this country. The President has already begun making good on his campaign promises with respect to climate change and energy, with memoranda to federal agencies on fuel efficiency standards and on California's request for a Clean Air Act waiver during just his first week in office. Um, we can anticipate energetic U.S. participation in the post-2012 treaty negotiations, presidential support for major legislation on cap and trade, and federal agencies' active integration of sensitivity to emissions and impacts into their decision making. Just this week alone, right, EPA Secretary Lisa Jackson said that the EPA would reopen the issue of regulating greenhouse gas emissions from coal-fired power plants 
Energy Secretary Stephen Chu um, began to explore how to use the $40 billion in the stimulus package for energy projects, which sort of connects us to the Dean's remarks about the economy. And the New York Times reported on the possible implications of an EPA endangerment finding in carbon dioxide in response to the Supreme Court decision in Massachusetts v. EPA. And then, of course, President Obama has been talking, has been in Canada and, and talking about, about uh, ways in which these two countries can collaborate, which are two of the countries struggling the most to get emissions down. But President Obama also faces many challenges as he embarks upon his energy and climate initiatives. These include questions such as the one posed to us by our dean, how will the economic crisis affect them, right? I mean, on, you know, so far he's been trying to make it a win-win, right, by, by putting things like, like renewable energy into his stimulus. But, but I think there, there are questions about how the economy is going to interact with his, um, his energetic um, efforts on climate and energy. What role should the United States demand that developing country major emitters like China and India play in the post-2012 treaty regime? And for any of you unfamiliar with what the post-2012 treaty regime is, that's the treaty regime that will replace the Kyoto Protocol when it expires. Um, well, we all hope will at least, right? We, we hope that there's going to be a treaty um, in place by then. Um, and, you know, can the economy-wide cap-and-trade regime he's committed to help create with, with, with Congress actually create the proper incentives and stimulate the green growth that we need um, in this country? This interdisciplinary symposium, which is being held one month after President Obama's inauguration, will assess the administration's initial steps on climate change and reflect on the road ahead. Um, as, as should be apparent, um, a number of presenters will participate remotely in order to reduce the carbon footprint of this conference um, in line with Washington and Lee's effort in sustainability. You'll also notice we made an effort to make our programs as green as possible. Our aim today is not only to provide interesting academic discussion, but also to, provide, to produce a policy assessment um, that might be useful to those advising the new administration. Um, a policy assessment both for our words today and through the eventual publication that will result. Um, and panels are going to focus on fundamental concerns that underlie the questions that I posed. So how should the Obama administration manage scientific and policy uncertainty? How should it address the ways in which this problem cuts across our traditional ways of organizing society with its levels of government? How should it navigate the climate energy intersection and in the process reconceptualize energy policy? How should it integrate justice concerns into the way in which it addresses the problem of climate change? Beyond the substantive conversation and scholarly work it generates, as I mentioned, this symposium will also serve as an initial planning meeting for a regional coalition of academics working on climate issues. We plan to build from this dialogue to encourage greater collaboration and coordination among academics and policymakers in the region. And as I sent out a notice to the environmental law professors listserv, I've also seen just so much interest beyond this region that we may talk about how we can both think regionally and, and beyond as we, as we work on this coalition. So with that, so that we actually start our first panel on time at 9.30. Let me join the chorus of welcome and turn the proceedings over to a colleague who I very much value and admire, Joanna Bond, to moderate the first panel. And please bear with us as we navigate the logistics for the first time of having three of the five panelists participate remotely. So. Well, let me also begin by saying welcome to all of you. I want to also say thank you to the dean, to my colleague, Hari Asofsky, to all of the students who played such an important role in organizing this symposium, and to the support staff who really helped make it happen. This symposium is organized around both academic themes and pragmatic themes. It's designed to stimulate new ways of thinking and talking about climate change, but it's also designed to have a direct and hopefully rather immediate impact on the new administration's climate policy. It will also serve, as you heard, as the first of many meetings of a, of a new regional coalition to, to talk about these issues. This conference and the ongoing conversation of this regional coalition 
will push the national and international conversation on climate change in important and new directions. Are we okay? Yes. Okay. No, no, that's quite all right. We'll be working out the kinks as far as the, the remote participation. A little bit early. Oh, okay. Joanna was, was chosen for this panel because she will calmly guide us through it. <laughs> Well, I do have some experience in, in remote communication, uh, and most of that experience suggests that the most important thing is patience. So we'll, we'll work through the kinks. So without further delay, let me, let me introduce the first panel on managing scientific and policy uncertainty. I'll introduce all of the panelists, and then I will turn the podium over to them. First, we'll hear remotely from Professor Robin Craig, the Attorney's Title Insurance Fund Professor of Law and Director of the Environmental and Land Use Program at Florida State University College of Law. Professor Craig is a water law specialist who has authored over 40 law review articles and book chapters on the subject. She also serves as the Chair of the ABA's Constitutional Environmental Law Committee, as Vice Chair of the Marine Resources Committee, and as Supreme Court News Editor for the ABA's Administrative and Regulatory Law News. The title of Professor Craig's paper is Adapting the Clean Water Act to Climate Change. Following Professor Craig, we'll hear from Professor Stephanie Stern. Professor Stern is an Associate Professor of Law at Loyola University, Chicago, whose research focuses on environmental risk perception and communication, state and local environmental regulation, and property law. She served as a private consultant on environmental law issues and currently serves on the board of the Center for Urban Environmental Studies. Professor Stern's presentation is entitled Risk Perception and the Law of Climate Change. Next, we'll hear from Professor Jonathan Weiner, who will also join us remotely. Professor Weiner is the Perkins Professor of Law and Professor of Environmental Policy and Public Policy Studies at Duke University. He's also a University Fellow of Resources for the Future. In 2003, Professor Weiner received the Chauncey Starr Young Risk Analysis Award for the Society for Risk Analysis for Exceptional Contributions to the Field by a Scholar Under the Age of 40. He's written widely on US, European, and international environmental law and risk regulation. His paper is entitled, Can We Adopt and Implement a Successful Comprehensive Cap and Trade Climate Policy? Yes, we can. Finally, we'll hear from Professor Yang, who's a professor of law and, and director of, of the Environmental Law School, uh, Sun Yat-sen University Partnership for Environmental Law in China. Professor Yang's research focuses on US and environmental law, US and international environmental law, including environmental justice, global climate change, and China's environmental laws. From 1998 to 2003, he served as a member of the EPA's National Environmental Justice Advisory Council and chaired the International Subcommittee. Professor Yang's presentation is entitled, Considering the Opportunities and Challenges of a Bilateral U.S.-China Carbon Reduction Agreement. So please join me in welcoming Professor Robin Craig. Good morning. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Uh, first of all, my thanks to Professor Osofsky and the members of the New Washington League Journal of Energy, Climate, and the Environment for inviting me to participate. Uh, and special thanks to Chuck Gates, who has been working with me uh, very patiently as I've been on the road to make even audio work. So uh, it's, it's great to be here in this format. Uh, my topic today is uh, the Clean Water Act and climate change, and it is sparked by the fact that on January 16th of this year, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency agreed to address the Center for Biological Diversity's petition uh, that the EPA revise its marine pH water quality criteria to acknowledge uh, the reality of ocean acidification. Now, ocean acidification uh, results because increasing concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, mean that more carbon dioxide dissolves into seawater, and as a result, uh, the 
carbon dioxide chemically reacts to form carbonic acid, and the pH of the oceans goes down. Uh, more detail than you needed, but the point is, this is a climate change impact, and uh, climate change has come to the Clean Water Act. So it's worth thinking about what uh, an existing tool like the Clean Water Act, and uh, probably this will extend to other pollution control statutes as well, can do in a climate change era. So to start with uh, some basics, the Clean Water Act regulates water quality. That's what it does. It's not a greenhouse gas emissions a statute, and it would be a stretch to make it one. Uh, it regulates in particular what sources uh, can put in terms of pollutants into various water bodies, including the ocean. Uh, it particularly looks at discharges of pollutants from point sources. Uh, but it also has a component uh, that's informational in terms of assessing what water bodies and species and aquatic ecosystems can tolerate in terms of pollution. And I think both of those aspects of the Clean Water Act are going to prove to be important for dealing with climate change impacts. Uh, so that also raises the issue of what climate change driven impacts will there be on water quality. Uh, the most obvious one is going to be temperature. As air temperatures increase, water temperatures do the same. Uh, but there will also be impacts on overall water flow. Projections for a lot of the country is that there will be less precipitation and as a result less water ending up in streams. Uh, there will also be effects on the timing of water flow, in, in particular in areas of the country that depend on snow melt for their summer and autumn water flow. Uh, climate change may reduce the amount of snowpack that occurs and hence uh, result in timing where there's more flow in the winter and spring and less in the summer and fall. All of that can result in different changes to the quality of the water that is uh, in existing streams and lakes. Uh, obviously temperature, but also if you have less water overall, you are concentrating pollutants. Uh, if you change the timing of water flow, you could also be uh, changing what the water picks up as it gets into the water body. There will be other kinds of aquatic chemical reactions. Temperature drives chemical reactions, uh, and ocean acidification is an excellent example of those kinds of reactions that may be occurring. And finally, all of that is going to add up to overall impacts on aquatic habitats, on ecosystems, and on the ecosystem services that they can provide to human beings. And one example that is currently being tracked, uh, Montana is known for its trout streams. Uh, it has a $300 million recreational fishing industry that depends heavily on the trout. Uh, it also has a $2.4 billion agricultural industry that depends on water being in the streams in the summer to provide irrigation for crops. Uh, both of those are being threatened uh, already by climate change. Trout like very cold water. Uh, the temperatures in Montana's trout streams are going up, and uh, it's foreseeable in the next few years that those trout streams will cease to be able to support trout uh, and the recreational fishing industry that goes with them. Uh, also, uh, Montana is a state that relies on snowpack for its summer flows. Uh, that is already uh, being reduced. As a result, the uh, summer agriculture that depends on irrigation is already being threatened. So we know we're going to have climate change impacts on water quality, on water resources. What can the Clean Water Act do to help? Well, first of all, I think the most important aspect of the Clean Water Act is the fact that it can increase resilience. It can increase the abilities of species, aquatic ecosystems, and the human societies that depend on them to uh, react to climate change, to adapt to climate change by reducing pollutant stressors. Uh, resilience is the capacity of social, ecological systems to absorb disturbances. And here, obviously, we're talking about climate change impacts. 
and still retain their essential structure functions. Uh, pollutants are a known stressor to ecosystem, particularly to aquatic ecosystems, and a stressed ecosystem, a stressed species, is less able to adapt to new stresses imposed on it, like increasing water temperatures and other climate change impacts. So the Clean Water Act uh, is already doing a good job of reducing those pollutant stressors. Uh, if you have the handout I sent around, uh, there are a bunch of other things that both the EPA and Congress do to improve the Clean Water Act's ability to uh, reduce those pollutant stressors. Uh, but it, like I said, it's already doing a fairly good job of that. The other important components, I think, of the Clean Water Act is that information aspect, uh, information generating aspect of the Clean Water Act. Uh, both the EPA and the states would use the Clean Water Act to increase our knowledge of what aquatic ecosystems are already experiencing, uh, what changes are occurring, and uh, what they can tolerate on the long, in the long run. And in that respect, I think one of the more uh, positive aspects of the EPA's decision to address Center for Biological Diversity's petition was in addressing ocean acidification, it is going to focus on what ocean acidification means for coral reef ecosystems. What can corals tolerate? And in particular, when are we likely to hit threshold events where the ecosystems are going to flip to some other state. But equally important, I think, is what can't the Clean Water Act do? Uh, first of all, the Clean Water Act cannot stop climate change impacts because of greenhouse gas emissions that have already occurred. We are committed to a certain amount of warming uh, that will occur over at least the next few decades and maybe centuries. Uh, and so those changes, like changes in temperature and water flow, are going to keep going, and there's not a whole lot that the Clean Water Act can do about it. Uh, the Clean Water Act also is not going to generate uh, by itself a rational or effective regulatory program for greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, now, major caveat, it's perfectly possible to wrap greenhouse gas emissions into the Clean Water Act, uh, if you're familiar with the total maximum daily load process, very easy uh, with Montana's trout streams, for example, to classify uh, greenhouse gas emissions as a non-point source that would have to be accounted for in the TMDL process, but it doesn't get you very far. Uh, both the EPA and the states lack the authority under the Clean Water Act to get to all the sources they would have to get to, uh, which is basically every source of greenhouse gas emissions in the world. Uh, and on top of that, it, it doesn't make for a rational mitigation policy to think about greenhouse gas emissions in terms of effects on local water bodies. So, my advice to President Obama's EPA about ocean acidification and the Clean Water Act in general with respect to climate change. First, uh, the administration should view the Clean Water Act and probably most other pollution control statutes as climate change adaptation tools. Uh, second, the EPA and Congress should strengthen the Act's ability to reduce pollution and hence build that resilience of aquatic ecosystems and the human societies that depend upon them. Third, uh, the EPA and the states should use the Clean Water Act to generate as much information about, as possible about the current and changing conditions in uh, our water bodies and what various kinds of aquatic ecosystems can tolerate but don't use the Clean Water Act as the occasion for generating mitigation policy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Craig. I want to mention that a, a brief change in the, in the
speaker schedule. Uh, I, have, I was apparently using a, an older version of the schedule. <coughs> Next up, we have J.B. Rule. Professor Rule is the Matthews and Hawkins Professor of Property at Florida State University College of Law, where he teaches courses on environmental law, land use, and property. Prior to joining the FSU faculty in 1999, Professor Rule taught at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale and at George Washington University in, from 1998 to 1999. He's the author, co-author of two case books, The Law of Biodiversity and Ecosystem Management, which is the first case book to organize environmental law under these emerging themes, and The Practice of Policy of Environmental Law uh, by Foundation Press, which is the only environmental law book. Bear with me for a moment, please. Case book incorporating a practice context focus. Uh, Professor Rule was Prior to entering full-time teaching, Professor Rule was a partner in the law firm of Fulbright and Jaworski, practicing environmental and natural resources law in Austin, Texas. So please join me in welcoming Professor Rule remotely. Thank you. Thank you. Can everyone see me and hear me? Uh, yes, all right. right. Can't see him yet. Great. Thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today uh, remotely. I'd like to uh, thank uh, Hari for uh, extending this invitation to me, and also kudos to uh, the law school for setting up this remote connection. Uh, we're reducing greenhouse gas emissions as, as I speak uh, as a result. So uh, I think this is an excellent uh, uh, way to uh, allow everyone to participate. Um, I think my talk and paper are in large part a very uh, large and emphatic ditto to what uh, my colleague Robin uh, just laid out with regard to the Clean Water Act. Uh, and that is that uh, I think we need to think very carefully about how we approach greenhouse gas mitigation under existing laws, how we integrate adaptation into uh, our, our policy, and how we coordinate across uh, agency programs. And uh, my concern that drives this paper is that up until now, our policy a formulation for existing laws has been largely ad hoc and litigation driven. And if we continue down this path, uh, it will not produce an integrated, uh, cohesive, multi-scale or national climate change policy. You may have noticed that uh, uh, last week, the uh, uh, Center for Biological Diversity uh, announced that they were embarking on a $17 million effort to, and I quote, <laughs> establish legal precedents requiring existing environmental laws, such as the Clean Air Act, the Clean Air Species Act, NEPA, Clean Water Act, etc., to be fully implemented to regulate greenhouse gas emissions, land management, and wildlife management. And my concern, of course, is that while it may have been necessary during the prior administration to uh, provide some jolts that would put existing laws into play in our national climate policy formulation, which has largely been focused on new legislation designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we're at a threshold now in which we can reasonably hope that uh, the current administration, the Obama administration, will uh, examine uh, existing laws and, and take up the Supreme Court's invitation in Massachusetts versus EPA to examine the flexibility that's inherent in these existing laws and use them, uh, use the discretion that's available to examine how to implement both climate mitigation and climate change adaptation in a coordinated manner. And litigation-driven policy will not produce that. In fact, I think that the, uh, the announcement uh, uh, that the lawsuits would be initiated is really not a very nice welcome map for the Obama administration uh, let's give them a chance, so to speak, to try to develop a policy that's coordinated and cohesive. Uh, <clears throat> the paper uh, will uh, use the Endangered Species Act as an example of the folly of pursuing a litigation-driven policy to develop uh, a climate change adaptation and mitigation policy. Uh, without going into detail on that today, but mainly to say, as I have said uh, in prior uh, work, including an article recently published in the Boston University Law Review, statutes like the Endangered Species Act uh, may provide uh, some discretion 
uh, for the agency, the Fish and Wildlife Service, for example, to pursue greenhouse gas emission regulation, but it would be a very clumsy and very inefficient and probably ineffective way of doing it. The Endangered Species Act is much better suited uh, for helping species adapt uh, and to respond to the effects of human adaptation on species. And I think, as Robin pointed out, the Clean Water Act, you might be able to find discretion uh, in existing laws uh, uh, that we had not previously thought of, of course, uh, for agencies to pursue mitigation regulation and adaptation regulation. But the question is, how aggressively should we uh, climb those mountains just because they're there, right? We need to think about how to coordinate across a very complex, uh, complex array of agencies at both federal, state, and local levels. And as we'll hear later today from speakers like Jonathan and uh, Tony Arnold, this is an extremely complex system we're trying to manage, both the climate and our governance system, to match them up in a, in a logical and coherent and effective way. I think what agencies need to have the chance to do is first put their statutes up against climate change. And that's a very difficult question. Where can we find discretion to <clears throat> potentially um, address both mitigation and adaptation? Sorry, I'm just making sure that's not someone calling me from there telling me that the, the, the uh, transmission is broken. Um, and uh, that takes some time. That's something I tried to do in the Boston University Authority articles examining the Endangered Species Act, line by line, to identify where in this, in this statute uh, could the agency pursue mitigation and or adaptation effectively. <clears throat> Let's test that range of discretion, again, line by line, and allow the agency to develop a coherent, integrated policy for exercising the discretion they may have effectively and, and also in a manner that's coordinated with other agencies <clears throat> to develop a national climate change policy, not a statute by statute, agency by agency climate change policy. It may be the case, for example, that an agency would not pursue the maximum of its potential discretion to regulate greenhouse gas emissions uh, because there's a better agency to do it or there's a more coordinated way to do it. Um, so we need to balance mitigation with adaptation within these agencies under these existing laws, and we need to coordinate across agencies. And the premise of all of this, of course, is new legislation, cap and trade, a carbon tax, uh, to address greenhouse gas emissions is unlikely to solve all of our problems. We will have some degree of committed warming uh, that will require adaptation, and we will have uh, gaps within any uh, new national legislation uh, in which state, local, and, uh, and federal agencies could use existing laws to help close the gap on the necessary reductions in, in uh, climate in greenhouse gas emissions. So the point is, let's, before we go down this path of litigation mitigation, <coughs> um, let's examine what authorities we have in a coordinated manner. So the paper closes, will close with a proposal that would first suspend all litigation, suspend the causes of action that the entities like the uh, Center for Biological Diversity or other entities uh, might use to try to push uh, agencies up the mitigation mountain without a map, so to speak. Uh, and we could do that both by uh, cutting off the APA and citizen suit uh, causes of action, or Congress could simply prohibit federal agencies from issuing uh, greenhouse gas emission regulations until they've gone through this reasoning process. So the proposal would follow suit with the requirement that agencies first go through the process of measuring their discretion to implement existing laws on, uh, with regard to mitigation and adaptation, to develop a policy position on how to use those authorities, to develop a proposed rule, <clears throat> and then across agencies there would be time for coordination through a task force that could then identify which agency ought to be doing what most effectively. At the end of this process, agencies would promulgate final regulations uh, implementing both mitigation and adaptation authorities under existing laws, also recommending to Congress uh, amendments to existing laws that might make the process and their authorities more effective. Uh, at the close of that process, which I anticipate would take about two years, judicial review of all new regulations would be uh, in the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, so we have a coordinated uh, judicial review process rather than courts all over the country filtering up uh, to courts of appeals, et cetera. So this, from top to bottom, I think would provide the Obama administration 
a chance to develop a coordinated national climate change policy under existing laws that can integrate seamlessly with whatever new legislation Congress and the Obama administration initiate to address greenhouse gas emissions and climate change adaptation. So I throw that out there for comment and interested in any comments you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Rule. And next we'll hear from Professor Stern. So thank you for inviting me here today and thanks to Hari and to Washington Lee and to this journal. My talk addresses public risk perception and climate change. And specifically I want to talk about the potential for laws addressing adaptation to serve as a risk communication and risk amplification device. As others here have mentioned already, I certainly see a dual role for mitigation for adaptation. And my particular interest in this talk is how we can use adaptation in addition to its many practical benefits in environment and health, but how we can use adaptation as a tool to increase public perceptions of risk and build momentum for mitigation strategies as well. So my focus here is on adaptation nationally in the United States. And of particular interest to me is local adaptation measures and the interplay between that and risk perception. So in this talk I first want to just briefly discuss at least one of the reasons why I think adaptation has come a little late to the climate change dialogue. Then I want to review some of the key findings in the risk perception literature and consider the interaction between adaptation laws and adaptive responses as a communicative device and public risk perception. So if I could start my PowerPoint. You can be anywhere in the room you want to be. Okay, well maybe I should migrate a little so I can see this. So first off, a question might come to mind, why should we care about public risk perception? Right, a few reasons. Policy makers operate in the context of public opinion. Political momentum can in some cases drive regulatory or success or failure. Public perceptions also have the ability to translate into personal momentum or personal actions that people might take to reduce their carbon footprint or mitigate their own environmental impacts. Now in terms of kind of the current state of American risk perceptions, we have done pretty well on the awareness front and on fostering belief in the scientific consensus on climate change. Research shows that over 90% of Americans are aware of global warming, three quarters believe it's real and already underway, and 72% describe themselves as somewhat or strongly concerned. There have been some problems, however, with translation. While there's concern in the abstract, this has frequently not translated into actual worry, into agenda setting and priorities, and into support for action. So for example, there's evidence that while people are abstractly concerned, when you ask them how often they actually worry about climate change, two-thirds worry only a little bit or not at all. Similarly, when asked to list their top ten national priorities, Americans list climate change usually at the bottom of the list or it doesn't make the list. And in a similar vein, there is an overwhelming majority that do not support any form of direct expenditure or gas tax. So what explains this disconnect? Researchers have found that one of the reasons that American risk perception is somewhat attenuated is that Americans don't perceive a very strong local impact. So when you ask people which of the following 
um, impacts are you most concerned about? Not only a minority point to effects on their family or their local community, right? The majority see effects elsewhere in the world. Um, now, certainly there is some truth to this risk perception uh, that effects elsewhere in the world we forecast will be more severe. Um, however, the extent uh, that Americans perceive this not to be an issue that affects them is troubling, uh, and I think indicates some underweighting of risk uh, and perhaps even a sense of national immunity to risk. So what I wanted to think about and think about in the um, framework of U.S. responses to adaptation is what drives what I call active risk perception, or what I've been thinking about as active risk perception. So by active risk perception, um, I mean a perception of risk uh, that is likely to encourage political momentum, personal action, to affect decision making, right? To be more than just a, a passive or abstract concern. Uh, in fact, there's a great deal of research that's been done on this topic, uh, and what uh, scientists have found is that uh, a few things really um, drive this sense of active risk perception, right? The first is vivid, concrete images. Um, and in fact, there's evidence that uh, when you ask people what's the first image that comes to mind when you think of global warming, uh, that image is a better predictor of risk perception uh, than the individual socio-demographic variables. Um, there's also uh, strong research supporting the notion that personal experience, um, personal relevance, uh, all drive risk perception, right? Probably not surprising to us. Um, and a link to emotion with these two, that imagery and personal experience um, are going to be linked to affect and emotion, and that that is going to be a driver of risk perception. So um, what I wanted to start thinking about in this project and in this talk is um, ways that we can kind of bring climate change home in people's risk perception thinking. So how can we take this abstract concept of climate change uh, and kind of interpret it in a language of local consequences um, to make it less distant in time, less distant in space, and more immediate? Uh, and so what I started to um, think about here was the potential for adaptive responses uh, and capacity building in this respect. Um, that adaptation uh, frequently is going to have a local element. Um, and therefore, it's going to have local and regional visibility, which should play into risk perceptions. Um, secondly, uh, adaptive responses right, are going to increase personal experience in the US um, with climate change and with the effects of climate change, um, and ideally highlight local costs. Now, I should add that this vision is really um, I think stands in contradiction or this research to uh, what I see as kind of an uneasy tension between adaptation and mitigation. Right? And what I mean by this is I've had the sense that among policymakers, among uh, environmentalists, even among academics to some extent, adaptation has come somewhat later to the dialogue than we might have expected um, and with comparatively less force right? because of this concern that um, uh, devoting resources and encouraging a dialogue and adaptation is going to <coughs> actually reduce public perceptions, right? That um, once we focus on adaptation, the public may um, cease to believe in global warming, um, or they might think it's true, but so easily addressable that, um, that we don't need to worry about it. Uh, and I think that this is the kind of fear that's lurked in this dialogue um, and, and really slowed our thinking and progress and adaptation. Uh, and what I'm trying to do in this talk is to point out that um, adaptation is quite likely to have the opposite effect, um, that it's likely to increase risk perceptions uh, by making these issues more personally relevant. Right? Climate change is not something that just affects um, geographically distant people or temporally distant future generations. Um, so I started to think about uh, some different ways that adaptation and adaptive responses um, could serve a risk communication function in law. Um, obviously, this is in addition to their other functions in addressing important consequences. Uh, and my particular interest is in um, local environmental approaches. 
Uh, and so I just uh, kind of started thinking about some options. Um, might we in the future turn to uh, uh, incorporating global warming into zoning uh, in a more comprehensive manner? So perhaps having global warming buffer zones. Um, incorporation into building codes. Uh, I think this is already uh, starting to happen. A recent article from the New York Times about um, the mayor in New York City uh, really turning to this issue. Um, similarly, you can imagine the local level adaptation as part of a locality's comprehensive plan. Um, local adaptation taxes. Taxes, of course, never popular. Um, interestingly, in Chicago, where I'm from, uh, Cook County itemizes the taxes, uh, exactly where your personal tax bill goes. Uh, I'm able to see every year that uh, actually multiple thousand dollars of my property tax money go to the Cook County Hospital, uh, which is a good cause. Uh, but it certainly highlights the cost um, of that venture to me. Um, also, I think this is already starting to happen. Disaster plans, um, registries of adaptation expenses. Uh, Seawalls and armoring are highly uh, visible um, and obviously practically useful approaches. Um, and also regional, state, and local responses to disruptions in water supply, right? I think all of these have the potential um, to not only increase public risk perception, but to make that risk perception more yeah. active. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, just some considerations or possible uh, questions that might come up. Is there a concern uh, with adaptation, and you know, I've occasionally seen this um, voiced or written, that we're going to do it so effectively and seamlessly and so much better than other countries um, that in fact it will have a risk dampening effect, right? The opposite of what I'm arguing. Uh, I personally don't agree with this. I think we have um, a real lack of experience uh, in uh, adaptive capacity building. Um, I think there's a very real difficulty of prediction and planning. Um, and so I don't see it as being a particularly easy or seamless process. Um, also, I think as we um, develop adaptive responses at the local level, which I've discussed, and also at the federal level, which other commentators have discussed, um, we're going to find secondary risks and unintended consequences. Um, so for example, building seawalls might impact wetlands. Uh, and that's another factor that kind of cuts against this idea of seamless adaptation um, that would result in the American public uh, being content uh, with the state of the art or even smug about our better adaptive capacities. Um, I, I predict a much more um, contentious and difficult struggle on this issue. Uh, another question that might come up is what incentive do localities have to act? Um, why are people with kind of a short political uh, time frame going to take action? Uh, and I think the answer to that um, is pretty obvious that uh, there are already adaptation um, effects occurring uh, that localities want to address. Um, and also that the time range needed to address adaptation is significant um, <coughs> because so much of it involves infrastructure planning and development. Um, so localities like the New York example uh, really do have some motivation to act. A few other considerations or thoughts, but I will save those for questions. Um, so I just want to conclude by noting that I think there's kind of a meta level to risk perception that is not entered into the dialogue, right? And by that I mean the risk perception among policymakers and among uh, academics that adaptation um, responses, adaptation law, may dampen public perceptions of risk, right? May make the public believe that um, global warming is not such a serious problem and that mitigation is not so important. Um, so I argue in this talk that the scenario is um, not so likely and that in fact there's significant potential for uh, carefully structured adaptive responses to uh, increase public perception of risk and to increase momentum for mitigation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Professor Stern. And next we have Professor Jonathan Weiner joining us remotely. Thank you. Welcome.
already there? Yes. Okay. Um, can you give me a test? Testing? Testing? Sounds great. Go right ahead. Okay, Joanna? Yes. Here we see you, Joanna. We can, we can see you and hear you. Okay, very good. I cannot hear you very well. Um, so I'll just, I'll try to uh, listen if you're talking to me. Uh, but thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to this symposium on uh, climate change policy. And thanks very much to Harry Azowski for her initiative and drive and pulling all of this together and inviting so many excellent speakers. I'm very pleased to be on this panel and the conference with so many being college and to be reducing your carbon footprint uh, by uh, joining me by video. I um, have a bit of a cold. I hope my voice doesn't sound too odd. <clears throat> my talk today is about the prospects for a comprehensive cap and trade system to protect the planet from climate change. And as the title of my talk indicates, it's a uh, 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 a talk of optimism, yes we can. And that I think is, uh, is a very refreshing sign compared to the situation uh, 10 or 15, 20 years ago when these uh, policies were uh, being debated in the international negotiations on the Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Kyoto Protocol, and certainly compared to the last eight years when uh, the United States federal government was not moving ahead with significant climate change policy. Uh, the topic of my talk is about the design of climate change policy, not the level of stringency. And uh, the essential point is that a comprehensive cap and trade system is the best design for climate change policy, both for the United States and for international uh, agreement. And that's because the Conference of Climate the Capital Trade System responds to and corrects key defects or failures in the design of environmental policy and law in the past, uh, in particular fragmentation, uh, insensitivity to trade-offs, rigid prescriptive commands and mismatched scale. And a comprehensive capital trade system responds to each of those defects in prior design uh, through integration, attention to trade-offs, incentives, and optimal scale. Let me say a little bit uh, about what I mean about uh, each of those. <clears throat> uh, historically, the United States and many other countries have used environmental policies that are uh, fragmented by sector of the economy and by particular problem uh, that focused on one risk or one pollutant at a time, one sector of the economy at a time, that were insensitive to trade-offs, uh, that uh, neglected not only benefit-cost trade-offs but also risk-risk trade-offs, even within the sphere of environmental benefit, uh, policies that these that solely on one target benefit and neglected uh, both countervailing risks, or that is to say ancillary harms, and also neglected uh, ancillary benefits uh, of the policies. And then use rigid prescriptive commands in which government uh, viewed markets as the problem, market failure as the source of environmental degradation, and so try to replace market signals with government instructions to adopt specific technology. Uh, and finally, with, uh, with mismatches of scale, with um, regulations uh, for very local problems adopted at the federal scale, or regulations of very global problems adopted at the local scale, and all of these problems have uh, hindered the performance of environmental policy. Uh, those, those criticisms should it's important to underscore, should not be taken as a criticism of environmental protection as uh, a social objective. They are criticisms of the design of the instruments that we have used to try to achieve environmental protection. But my uh, optimism and confidence is that we can 
design better environmental uh, policy. We've learned a great deal, uh, and we can do better. Uh, so when we come to the problem of climate change, which is really a problem of the tragedy of the global commons, tragedy of the climate commons, in which uh, emissions impose global uh, external harms, and the emissions of greenhouse gases mix globally in the atmosphere, uh, but abatement is costly to local actors, and so there's widespread free riding. Uh, and the, the difficulty is how to design an instrument that will be effective, a policy that will be effective at not only uh, protecting the planet through reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also at securing participation of key actors, uh, persuading the U.S. Congress to adopt it, and also persuading other countries to adopt it. Because in our uh, current international legal system, treaty law is only binding on countries that consent to participate. Uh, we're not, even if some people would hope for some kind of global governance or world government system in which uh, uh, regulations uh, on issues like climate change could be imposed on countries, where uh, even if that system were uh, coming, it's not coming in kind of soon and it has its own disadvantages. So uh, we have to adopt climate change policy in the current international legal framework uh, in which we live, and that is the system in which countries have to be persuaded to participate. So in that context, um, the comprehensive cap and trade system has notable advantages. Compared to uh, a, the, the traditional Command technology system, uh, cap and trade system is, offers much lower cost, and lower cost is both important because of the, the social resources it conserves, and therefore uh, it's uh, able to perform better at uh, reducing poverty, and it's less regressive, it's less burdensome on lower income populations, uh, but also uh, because the cap and trade system is lower cost, it's much more attractive to uh, political decision makers to and opt, more likely to attract participation. And that, I think, is a key reason that you see cap and trade system being adopted uh, in Europe after years of opposition to cap and trade in Europe, the European Union, when it finally had to implement its uh, climate change policies, uh, shifted quite dramatically to, uh, to adopt a cap and trade system. Also, in the regional programs in the United States, and the Red G program, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative in the Northeast, and the Western Climate Initiative, cap and trade is the leading approach. Uh, and the bills in the U.S. Congress, uh, for several years now, have almost all adopted cap and trade uh, instrument designs. So, in all of those cases, uh, uh, Policymakers are recognizing the cost saving advantages of cap and trade systems and also the inefficient enhancing advantages of cap and trade systems compared to traditional commands technology regulations, which cost more and which tended to uh, uh, stagnate technological change because once the government's technology was mandated and installed, there was no incentive to do better. Whereas in a cap and trade system, or a tax, there's a continuing incentive um, to do better. A second reason that cap and trade is particularly well suited to climate change is that uh, greenhouse gas is mixed globally, and so there are um, almost no hotspot problems with the major greenhouse gases. And in the past, uh, environmental groups have been concerned about cap and trade programs because of the prospect of hotspots, of local concentrations of pollutant emissions by firms that purchase uh, large numbers of allowances. Now, there are, there are reasons to think that even in those conventional air pollutant uh, 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 issues, that hotspots were not as serious a concern uh, as had been raised, but it, it was uh, conceivable. Um, in the climate change problem, we, we uh, have a um, few of those hotspot problems. Certainly for CO2 and methane and uh, major greenhouse gases like that, we are dealing with the globally mixing pollutant, which both is, this, is, is part of the reason for the collective action problem, 
but also is the uh, reason that cap and trade may be attractive to environmental groups uh, as well, many environmental groups who were suspicious of cap and trade in the past or for other problems. Uh, third, let me uh, just briefly touch on the comparison between cap and trade and tax approaches. The tax approach emphasized the ability to contain costs by setting the tax rather than uh, setting the quantity of emissions under cap and trade and the ability to raise revenues. But I think neither of those is really an essential uh, difference or defect with cap and trade. Because the cap and trade system can also raise revenues by selling or auctioning the allowances. And the cap and trade system can contain costs, for example, by setting um, price ceilings and price floors. And there's uh, interesting new research uh, suggesting that uh, the cap and trade system with a range of prices uh, established through price ceilings and price floors can actually be so much uh, less costly while still maintaining the quantity cap on emissions that it would enable legislators to choose a more stringent cap uh, on a cap and trade system at the same cost uh, that they would have achieved for the cap and trade system with no price ceilings or price floors, that is to say, uh, to be more aggressive environmentally. Another version of this uh, cost containment strategy is to create a reserve of additional allowances and uh, my colleagues at Duke's uh, Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions have been uh, working on an approach for a carbon market reserve which uh, is a limited quantity, not an unlimited safety valve, but a limited quantity of allowances that could be sold with prices in the market for uh, allowances rise. So that's another strategy for cost containment. But the real difference between the cap and trade system and a uh, tax, uh, and also the command uh, technology system, is the ability to attract participation. And so here the, the crucial issue is that the cap and trade system, unlike other designs, can be uh, designed, adopted, and implemented in a way that attracts participation through the initial allocation of allowances. It uh, enables policymakers to separate the question of allocated efficiency, uh, how much we want to uh, regulate this uh, global public goods problem, this global products problem, from distributive, distributive uh, concerns about the allocation of allowances, which a, which a tax or command technology policy design do not offer. And so we've seen that uh, historically in the US has raised trading program, allowances were uh, allocated for free by the Congress, but special extra allowances were offered to key Western states and industries in order to attract the participation of their representatives in Congress. In the European Emission Trading System, the allocation of allowances was a crucial factor in the ability to get all of the European Union member countries to agree to the EU Emission Trading System, whereas for 10 years, the EU had been trying to adopt a carbon tax and had been unable to do so, in particular because of the opposition from uh, countries which felt the tax would be excessively costly on uh, their uh, lower income economies, especially in Southern Europe. And in the Kyoto Protocol, uh, the way that Russia was engaged to participate and ratify the Kyoto Protocol, which was essential to the Kyoto Protocol's continuing the force, was through the allocation of allows so optimistic that yes, we can design a cap and trade system for uh, multiple greenhouse gases that's comprehensive and therefore uh, overcomes the problems of fragmentation that would result from focusing on just one greenhouse gas at a time and, and thereby encouraging a perverse increases in emissions of other greenhouse gases. And that uses the cap and trade architecture both domestically and internationally to engage participation by by the now, I know that Professor Sun Yang is going to speak about China, and, and I have uh, uh, been writing recently also about how best to engage China, but uh, I've taken enough time at this, so I'm not going to go further to tell on that, but I, I have, uh, in short, uh, reasons to think that the prospect of engaging China with the United States through the international capital trade system are getting brighter, uh, uh, and that we uh, have a good basis if the Obama administration is 
able to navigate simultaneously the domestic front of climate change legislation and the international front of the negotiations uh, moving towards COVID-19 in the study from 2009 and beyond to engage both China and the United States in a comprehensive cap and trade system. I do think that those have to be uh, addressed simultaneously and iteratively because the United States Senate is not likely to ratify uh, the new treaty that does not engage participation by China and other major developing countries, nor is the Congress likely to adopt stringent regulations on U.S. industry uh, domestically unless it sees uh, action by uh, other major countries, in, in particular China. And at the same time, China is not likely to act if it does serious action uh, by the United States. So I think those have to be done uh, in concert. And uh, despite the uh, the press of, uh, of the issue, of the urgency of the climate change issue, and the pressure of the uh, near-term deadline to achieve an agreement in Copenhagen in December 2009, uh, I'm optimistic that with a comprehensive cap-and-trade policy design, we can adopt and implement a successful climate change policy. Thank you. Thank you so much for those remarks, and, and thank you, too, for the perfect segue into Professor Yang's presentation. So I will turn it over to Professor Yang. Thank you. Thank you. I have some slides also. So that really was the perfect segue uh, from Jonathan. So thank you, Jonathan. Um, I have a few slides, and I'm not used to not being able to watch my slides as I'm, I'm, uh, I'm talking, but I'm going to try anyway. Um, uh, before I start, actually, I wanted to um, also uh, really express my gratitude to Hari and, and, of course, the organizers of the symposium, to Dean Smola and, and everybody else involved for inviting uh, me and my colleagues from China here uh, to, to be here and to participate. I think this is really a, 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 an opportune time to talk about this, as, as Dean Smola pointed out, uh, in the context of a new administration and a commitment to addressing climate change issues. And for our topic, um, uh, U.S.-China cooperation. It's particularly opportune because Senator or uh, Secretary Hillary Clinton is, of course, in China today uh, discussing um, uh, the future relationship um, uh, between the U.S. and China, including issues of climate change uh, with the uh, leadership of, of the uh, China central government. Um, and as I mentioned just now, I also, uh, before I start, I wanted to introduce uh, two colleagues of mine here. Uh, from China who have been uh, with us at Vermont Law School for this past academic year. Um, we have a uh, professor, Jia Ru Ho, who is an assistant professor at uh, the China University of Politics and Law. Uh, he is an environmental law specialist, and he's also the chief volunteer at the Center for Legal Assistance to Pollution Victims, which is really the only and, and leading environmental uh, advocacy NGO in, um, uh, and litigation NGO in, in China. And the other colleague here is uh, Professor Jill Wei from the South China Agricultural University uh, Law School, also an environmental law specialist. They're in residence uh, at Vermont Law School and part of our uh, partnership um, uh, activities um, in China developing and really uh, engaging in capacity building uh, focused on environmental law. Um, the focus, as I said, of my presentation is on uh, the potential, the opportunities, the challenges of uh, U.S.-China Carbon Reduction Agreement, and really more specifically on a potential for a uh, carbon trading agreement between the U.S. and China. Um, the motivation of this, I think, are really ought to be, or the uh, rationale for this ought to be obvious. Uh, China and the United States are, of course, the number one and two uh, greenhouse gas emission sources in the world, yet the U.S. is, of course, not subject to the Annex B limitation under the Kyoto Protocol because the U.S. is not a party. And uh, China is equally not uh, subject to those Annex B limitations because China, uh, as a developing country participant, uh, does not have any inscribed um, limitations on Annex B. And, and what's actually more of concern is that over the last few years, China's annual growth in greenhouse gas emission has been over 10 percent. And so it's projected to double its greenhouse gas emissions really over the next decade or two, um, which is uh, given that it's already the top greenhouse gas emitter is is of significant concern. Um, now, at this point, I think there's uh, some particular uh, uh, opportunity to, to talk about U.S.-China cooperation, in part because, of course, the politics of, 
of uh, climate change has changed. Um, as uh, has been mentioned already before, the United States at this point is it's much more ready to engage the rest of the world, as well as, of course, engaging China. And there have been a number of calls and suggestions for closer cooperation. Stephen Chu, the Secretary of Energy, has uh, been involved in, um, in past discussions about what kind of opportunities there were, uh, that there might be. And, of course, as I mentioned, Secretary Clinton is in, in China uh, at this point. Uh, but there have also been uh, changes, of course, um, um, uh, prompted by the ongoing uh, negotiations that are supposed to be leading up to Copenhagen about the uh, post-Kyoto 2012 uh, regime. Uh, I think all of that is contributing to some international pressure and to a desire by the Chinese government leadership uh, to engage more and to take a greater leadership position on what is perceived to be a, uh, a concern of global importance and really this idea that China is perceiving, um, seeing itself as becoming... Um, uh, a much more important global player, uh, really sort of taking its place again among uh, the leading nations on issues of global importance. But internally, uh, there's also been uh, significant um, uh, progress. Uh, within Chinese politics, uh, climate change has become uh, more important. There's been a much greater inf uh, emphasis on energy conservation, energy efficiency, uh, and a much greater top-level commitment to uh, addressing climate change issues, mostly or la lately um, uh, resulting in this uh, white paper in, uh, in October of last year that focuses on the, uh, China's uh, policies and actions for addressing climate change. And then finally, there's also this uh, concern with ensuring uh, continued and uh, dependable economic growth for China that in large part is, of course, driven by uh, energy. Uh, and the concern about uh, ensuring an energy, a steady and secure energy supply uh, that will um, allow China to continue to grow and, and, and develop. And that, uh, in that kind of uh, policy, ensuring or promoting energy efficiency and energy, energy conservation as a way of reducing energy demand is, of course, uh, an important policy option that the uh, Chinese government has, has pursued. Now, before going into this issue of uh, uh, U.S.-China bilateral cooperation, one has to, of course, also ask, why can't any of this be done within the context of Kyoto? And there's no reason why it couldn't be. But I think there's significant impediments here, um, which I think ought to lead one to consider alternative options that ought to be uh, pursued on, on parallel track, mind you, not necessarily exclusive of Kyoto, but certainly uh, in parallel with uh, whatever is going on uh, going towards uh, Copenhagen. And that is, of course, as I mentioned, at this point, neither uh, U.S. or China are uh, subject to Annex B limitations. U.S., of course, could easily fix that by uh, ratifying uh, the Kyoto Protocol, but there's an underlying practical issue here, of course. We are already well into the 2008 to 2012 commitment period, a year, over a year into this. The goal, the target for the United States is 7% uh, under 1990 levels. Um, last year, I'm sorry, not last year, the 2007 greenhouse gas emission levels for the United States were at 17% uh, above 1990 levels. So that means that the United States, in order to come to that target by 2012, has to reduce emissions by uh, somewhere around 24%. Um, uh, great challenge, of course. And what's even worse is that, uh, or what makes it even more difficult, is that that 7% uh, below 1990 levels is really an average of that 2008 to 2012 commitment period. And given that we're way above, uh, there would actually be a need to go way below uh, that uh, target level in order to be in compliance. The other issue, of course, for China is that you could easily, or, or uh, you could, uh, there would be a straightforward process amendment of the Kyoto Protocol that would include China. But the question, of course, ought to, would be, uh, what ought to be uh, China's um, uh, target B under Kyoto. Uh, and given that we're well into this commitment period, I think uh, that the process and the lead time that China would have to accomplish that, uh, I, I think, would be um, a challenge. And so um, here is one, then, uh, one gets to this, uh, this question of whether uh, there ought not to be something that the U.S. and China could do bilaterally. And as uh, Jonathan mentioned, I think, there's a significant political uh, rationale here, of course. Um, that is that um, the politics here in the, Ch in the United States is always focused uh, in significant part on the developing world, and especially on China, uh, because of that um, 
uh, that uh, bilateral relationship that has not always been tension free. Uh, and having a, a bilateral uh, effort, I think, uh, has in many respects multiple benefit. In many respects, I would consider or characterize uh, a bilateral carbon trading agreement almost as a no regret strategy in that it has both short term and long term uh, um, benefits. Uh, the short term and the so traditional benefits uh, include what Jonathan has already mentioned, that is, so these efficiencies uh, and the overall ability to lower uh, carbon abatement costs. Um, and of course, for uh, the United States, it would allow for uh, uh, short term and ready access to um, uh, relatively or comparatively inexpensive uh, carbon credits because uh, China's economy is still very energy inefficient, ener energy inefficient. There are significant opportunities for conservation and pollution reduction. Um, and this kind of a, a bilateral effort would allow for access to what one might describe as a low-hanging fruit. Um, at the same time, of course, it would also address, I think, one of the most significant concerns for China, that is uh, the need for more financial assistance uh, and uh, technology transfer and investment. And this, of course, again, would allow for or facilitate sort of a stream of, of technology investment and, um, and financing uh, to China uh, from the United States. There are also important collateral benefits um, in terms of environmental improvement and uh, public health. Uh, much of China's uh, carbon emissions are the result of coal-fired power plants, and coal-fired power plants, of course, spew not only carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, but also sulfur dioxide and particulate matters, uh, which are uh, significant problems with respect to uh, pollution, air quality, and, and uh, public health impacts. But having said all of that, actually, I actually don't quite see those as the most important <laughs> reasons to consider this. There is a much more important, I think, long-term uh, rationale for this kind of engagement, and that is the focus that a bilateral cooperation agreement on, on carbon reduction and, and really so carbon trading would put on governance issues. Governance issues uh, and the barriers to uh, effective regulation of the environment and to uh, regulating carbon emissions more generally that I think are far, far more important. Um, and there's a particular uh, opportunity here um, in that China is at this point uh, discussing and has been discussing for, for some years now, but I think there's a, uh, um, uh, there's a, this issue is coming to a head. Uh, the amendment of its uh, Air Pollution uh, Prevention and Control Act, uh, last amendment uh, came through in 2000, and it's really overdue. There have been uh, amendments to the Water Pollution Prevention and Control Act uh, just earlier this year, and this is sort of the uh, big one that's coming up. And any kind of carbon emission reduction uh, framework and, and trading agreement would obviously involve um, uh, amendments to, uh, uh, to the statute. Um, but as I said, the larger issue here is the need to focus on institutional capacity building and reform. And that is a direct result of the institutional weaknesses in China's environmental regulatory uh, system and governance system, in that one cannot have, at this point, I think, uh, serious confidence in China's uh, system being able to properly uh, monitor emission reductions uh, the, the, uh, the measurement of emissions or trades that might result from a, uh, a largely domestic system of uh, carbon emission reductions, or alternatively, a confidence in the enforcement of permits or allowances that might be issued. Um, now, that is a larger problem that uh, plagues uh, uh, China's environmental governance system, um, not just with respect to carbon emissions or um, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions generally, but also with respect to pollution. This is uh, one of the biggest challenges of making, uh, of improving and enhancing China's environmental regulatory system. And the idea here, the, the, the long-term benefit of bilateral cooperation is to give the United States a concrete stake in enhancing and building China's environmental uh, regulatory capacity, governance capacity, and regulatory infrastructure, and giving China a concrete incentive set of financial incentives to improve those institutions uh, and to enhance their effectiveness. And so uh, this is really a way of, of uh, building uh, these uh, institutional resources on a long-term basis, uh, not just the uh, direct um, uh, resources that are necessary for 
uh, emission reduction measurement, uh, control allowance of uh, trading of allowances and enforcement, but of course also larger structures uh, necessary for promoting the rule of law, the independence of uh, uh, the judicial system, uh, the uh, at present uh, large lack of an environmental bar that can serve as a resource uh, for private citizens who might um, uh, want to bring cases uh, with respect to air pollution and, and uh, GHG emissions, as well as a resource for government uh, agencies um, in terms of the enforcement work. And of course, um, uh, public participation and civil society. All of these kinds of issues, I think, uh, would become a much more significant uh, focus uh, because the United States would have a greater stake in, um, in promoting or, or enhancing this uh, these system and uh, the Chinese government would uh, obtain a concrete financial uh, incentive to uh, promote this. And this is actually a corollary of where China's climate change policy has been up to now. This is so interesting in that um, uh, Professor Stern sort of mentioned this, uh, the issue of adaptation. Um, in many respects, I would characterize China's climate change policy uh, of addressing energy efficiency, energy conservation, and economic development largely as a policy of adaptation. Adaptation in the sense that China is focused on growing its economy, uh, increasing national wealth as a way, arguably, of uh, having the financial resources that can be used uh, to build seawalls, to, to enhance um, uh, I'm almost done, actually. <laughs> uh, to, to build sea walls and, and to, to um, give its society the capability of dealing with the impacts, the future impacts of, of climate change. Now, this is, of course, a huge challenge, and, and I really don't want to detract and, uh, uh, from, from the task and, uh, and, and suggest that this is easy to do, but it really is an opportunity to, to, to engage, I think, both the, the U.S. government and China, China's government on these issues. Uh, the other significant challenges here, of course, are uh, what kind of carbon cap uh, ought there uh, be? You cannot have a, uh, uh, any kind of effective and um, uh, functioning uh, trading system, even a bilateral one, without having a firm sense of what uh, the overall emissions cap ought to be. And then within China, of course, there's a, a still remaining significant issue of the transition to a um, uh, from a planned economy to a, a market economy and questions about the maturity of markets and uh, social acceptance of, of, of markets. Now, I'm going to leave it at that, but I would probably um, invite uh, during the uh, questions and answers uh, my colleagues if, if they have uh, answers to any of the questions uh, that may be posed. So, thank you. Very much, Professor Meg. Uh, I'd like to open it up for Q and A at this point, and thank the panelists again for setting the stage wonderfully for the ongoing conversation that we'll have about these issues throughout the day. Uh, we don't have a cordless mic, so if you could just uh, say your name and state your question. State which of the panelists you'd like to direct your question to, and if you could speak as loudly as possible, that would be great. Thanks. Um, I, JB, can you hear me? JB, I'll have to hang up with you to Jonathan or Dr. Ross. Can we get him on my phone? Yeah. <coughs> um, why don't I hold my phone? So I wanted to push JB on something. I, should oh, I guess he can probably hear because he's probably watching the stream. Yeah, you should, you should be watching the stream. Anyway, let's listen Okay. Yeah, it's David Work. I actually, uh, from Boston College Law School, I actually had a question for Professor Rule as well. But until we get him back, I have a question for Professor Young. If I were the uh, European Environment Commissioner listening to your talk, I would say, well, that sounds very nice, except I would be concerned about one thing which is that the United States and China, both of which are outside the Kyoto regime, could very well get together and in what could be interpreted as a collusive way, basically set the agenda for the remainder of the planet. If you go back to your pie chart, between those two countries, you've got more than 50% of, or something close to 50% of all the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, as the Q 
Kyoto Party, it, it looks like a, a bit of forum shopping, so to speak, to take an initiative on the bilateral, on a bilateral basis and then potentially create a coalition between the United States and China and sell it to the rest of the world, particularly when those countries have not engaged in significant productions. And so I was wondering what your response to that would be. Um, <laughs> I think that's, a, that's an important concern. I, I think the way I would maybe recharacterize the question is, is one of global governance, right? Global governance of who should be participating in this. And given, and I think this has been, this has been an issue that China's also raised before. I mean, in, in, in past, I think, um, China's position has been that there ought to be no bilateral discussions, really. There's nothing to talk about. Climate change is a global issue. And there is a global forum, uh, a global negotiation process, which is the Kyoto and, and the Copenhagen process, that the United States has to, um, uh, you know, uh, feed into. And, and so part of that would be for the United States to, to ratify Kyoto. And, you know, I think there's, um, there's important considerations here, of course, with respect to, um, uh, to, the, to the need to be inclusive. I, I think I, I, for one, I think, given my background and in my interest in environmental justice, I, I see this as an important, uh, critical value. But I think there are also countervailing considerations, of course. And one of the top priorities has to be how to engage both China and the U.S. in this process. At this point, they're really outside still, right? I mean, they may be participating in formulating what's going to happen in Copenhagen, but, um, you know, they haven't really, uh, neither one has, uh, has made any uh, specific concrete uh, uh, commitments. Um, and, and the secondary matter, I think, a global, uh, global agreement, a global process, I think has also needs to consider not only the number of nations involved, but also what the role of those nations are, right? I mean, think about China. China is 1.3 billion people. It's, uh, what, almost a uh, little less than a quarter of the world's population. And the United States, of course, is a, a leading, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, country, of course, in terms of its uh, influence. And so, you know, in some respects, I think, um, uh, to have these two leaders, I think, involved in, 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 a, um, uh, in these discussions, it doesn't seem to me too inappropriate. I think I, I agree with you that there's serious concerns, but, but um, given sort of the practicalities, I, 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 you know, I am not as uh, um, sanguine about, about uh, this uh, process at least going forward on a parallel basis, I think, uh, in, in um, uh, you know, in parallel track to, to what's happening uh, in going towards Copenhagen. We're ready to go back to JB. JB, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, Professor Hart, I'm sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry to borrow Jonathan's title, but yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> JB, I, I, uh, I really enjoyed your interesting presentation, and, and I just wanted to push you a little bit on something um, I, which I'm sure won't shock you, namely, um, you're, you're wanting to, to put a sort of a limit on litigation. Um, I, I understand that, that groups might want to use restraint and in, in, in give the Obama administration a chance to um, get things going before, before litigating. But it makes me nervous the idea of taking away the regulatory tool of litigation from those groups um, by putting some sort of an official stall on it. Um, because it seems like, you know, as much as I think that, that the Obama administration is, 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 you know, pushing forward on this issue, I also, I also, you know, want us to be able to push them if we need to. And, um, and so I, I was curious why you want to go so far as actually sort of putting that kind of a stop. Sure. Um, well, you know, I don't think it would take much less than two years for any agency on it, acting on its own to accomplish a rulemaking anyway. My main interest is to, to allow them to, well, actually, my, my proposal would work them uh, to actually require federal agencies to engage in this process of providing a report to Congress that examines uh, line by line, if you will, with the range of discretion available in the statute that articulates the agency policy and that creates then a task force that could come back to each agency and say, that's not enough or you've done too much, we're going to shift this responsibility over to that agency. So it provides a coordinated forum in which to do this and it would actually require agencies to engage in this process rather than either waiting for them to do it of their own initiative, obviously with direction from uh, 
executive, but uh, or, or forcing them through litigation, which of course litigation could take much longer than two years. It could produce results that we're not really happy uh, about. So uh, I think of this as actually more proactive than simply stalling or slowing down. But the point is, let's not do this in, in an atmosphere of litigation, and let's do this in a way that's actually coordinated and all at the same time. We have one more question for Professor Wolf. Would you like to ask a question? Yeah, um, again, David Ward from Boston College Law School. I just wanted to build on Professor Osowski's question with an observation that not all litigation is necessarily hostile. Uh, a lot of times agencies uh, welcome litigation as a spur to action. Um, and also, given the, the delays that we've already had on the global warming issue, two years is a long time. Uh, and perhaps we can't afford that kind of delay before, uh, before some pressure is applied to the system. Also, um, the, if your proposal were, were adopted, it would be basically asking in the environmental community to buy sort of a pig and a poke, which in the past has not been uh, particularly well received among the uh, individuals and organizations that have crafted environmental law up to this point. And I would just suggest last that uh, a proposal like this could attract a lot of negative attention and could be uh, somewhat incendiary uh, as perceived among the public and particularly the environment. And, and that, to that extent, might be counterproductive. I'm sorry, I couldn't catch all of that. Is that David? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to what I what I caught, and if I if I miss anything, uh, please just follow on. Uh, True enough, some litigation is welcome uh, agencies. Uh, it, it, they, they want to jolt into action. Of course, my proposal would do the same thing. It would simply be coming from Congress versus uh, from an interest group pursuing litigation. Of course, litigation is a, can be a very messy affair. I mean, uh, you uh, could anticipate intervention, uh, uh, a long tracking process. Uh, Massachusetts versus EPA took longer than two years from beginning to end. Uh, and we still don't have anything uh, from EPA. Of course, it was a different EPA than the one we're dealing with now. My sense is we're dealing with agencies that uh, may welcome uh, a, a, an initiative from Congress that uh, allows them to work in concert, that gives them uh, time. If it takes less than two years for an agency to complete the process, that's fine. But I do think one thing that's missing from the lit litigation approach is uh, coordination between agencies and also between scales of government, which my proposal would require the agencies to consider. So I still don't, I, you know, I, I understand there are pros and cons of both approaches, but when I weigh the uh, litigation approach to against my proposal, I, I feel more comfortable with a proposal coming from a proactive uh, initiative by Congress uh, coordinating the agencies. Uh, two years, uh, I, I granted, I would love it if we had climate change mitigation and adaptation policy in place in two months. But it's not going to happen. I think we're deluding ourselves if we think that litigation is going to make that happen in any coordinated, integrated way. So uh, let's, let's actually come up with a plan uh, that, that pulls together our governance rather than uh, and splits it up through agency-specific litigation. Okay, we had a question over here. Um, Jamie, don't go away. Still there. I still I haven't disconnected. I just want to make sure that uh, Jonathan was okay. It, it, it seems like he had some comments, but um, uh, Jonathan, if you're listening, we'll get back to you. Hi, JB. Rebecca Bradspees. Um, it seems to me that the piece you're not acknowledging is that agencies have made a whole bunch of decisions that are moving forward, and. Your two-year hiatus will allow a tremendous number of uh, decisions that will change things on the ground with regard to climate change to move forward. And if we're not going to allow litigation to challenge those decisions, like the mining leases that have been issued are just one of many um, uh, decisions that will have tremendous global warming implications, it seems to me that it's a very weighted and, and a, uh, a disparate remedy that you're proposing. 
because everything that was already approved by agencies goes forward, and yet any questioning of that is frozen in place while the agencies figure out their mandate. Uh, okay, so as I understand this question, what I thought of it was that uh, uh, in the interim of this two-year period, uh, uh, as agencies move forward, uh, what would happen, I guess, if we have existing policies already in place or agencies are taking decisions about, say, uh, issuing a permit? Uh, the main thrust of my proposal is, uh, I suppose we call it major rulemakings. The rulemakings we're expecting out of agencies like uh, uh, EPA or the Fish and Wildlife Service or the Securities Exchange Commission. And this is not just limited to environmental uh, agencies. Um, you know, if, uh, I mean, I certainly uh, uh, open to consideration of the length of the, of the uh, uh, suspension, if you will. Uh, it struck me that two years to achieve a, a final regulation uh, that has been sort of vetted through a coordination process is not much longer than any other major rulemaking uh, that we have seen in the environmental realm in particular. Um, if agencies do, in say their permitting decisions, uh, take positions that, uh, uh, in the course of say challenging that permit, whoever might be challenging it, whether it's a business or environmental interest group, uh, I don't have any problem with that being fair game, so to speak, um, so long as the this, the challenge is not designed to to. Uh, force the agency into taking a particular uh, policy position or, or initiating rulemaking about mitigation or adaptation. And that's, that to me is the, the main thrust of the proposal is to allow the agency to uh, implement, to come up with a policy and, and actual rules for implementing existing agency authorities in a comprehensive uh, mitigation and adaptation way that's coordinated with other agencies. I just don't see how that how litigation brings that about. And in fact, I think it could be destructive of that ultimate uh, uh, goal as agencies might be forced into taking positions uh, uh, through st statutory specific litigation that wouldn't be the agency's position uh, and shouldn't be the agency's position uh, if uh, we were to allow a government-wide coordinated process. I think we have time for two more questions, and I saw a hand here and there. So. Okay, uh, I have to sit down to ask one. Okay. <laughs> this is for um, Professor Stern. Um, I'm aware of some uh, research in disaster preparedness response areas. That uh, this is actually something that the Red Cross would teach people that if you show people um, how to respond to disaster, you get better action. That if you show them what might happen, <coughs> if you show them how to pack your kit that's going to get more action than if you showed them um, their house being blown away. So I wondered if you were familiar with that and if that um, informs at all what you're seeing in this uh, response to climate change here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, when you're discussing the research of when you show people what to do, you get um, uh, a better response. By that, um, it sounds like you're referring to uh, an actual better practical response to the disaster at hand. Um, and then I've talked a little bit about the vivid images. I think the nexus between those two is um, the point about experiential learning, um, that uh, statistical abstractions are not very helpful to us, that our personal experiences, and whether it's uh, you know, a personal experience or an experience of someone in our network that summons up an image, or a personal experience of kind of showing people what, you know, practically what to do and what steps to take. Um, that that is a much uh, stronger driver of response. And I'm not sure if I call it risk perception in the sense that you're talking about, but maybe risk, uh, risk reaction. So I'm not, I hope that, does that answer your question? Uh, well, it was more proposing it to just be sure of something that you were thinking about too. <laughs> right, well, you know, I, um, in that kind of big you know, catch-all list of just various things that occurred to me in thinking about this talk, um, the disaster preparedness was, was one of them, and really building on, on what you're saying, and I'm interested to see um, you know what? Uh, what is developing right now in, in localities on that issue? Hi, Noah Sands from University of Richmond. Also, a question for, for you, Stephanie. Um, 
I think that there's a little bit of a, a contradiction in this problem of uh, uh, the American public doesn't believe that climate change is a local problem. And yet the, the adaptation measures you propose all about spending lots of money locally to respond to climate change. Uh, I think there's still tremendous uncertainty bars over climate change effects and where they're going to happen. Uh, the uh, uh, predicted sea level rise varies from you know, 20 centimeters to over 100 centimeters. Even more difficult to predict away from the coast. So how do you get a local town to, let's say, voluntarily create setback requirements or voluntarily put up 100 million for a seawall when, uh, when it's, I, in my opinion, too early to predict where these effects will happen? Right. Yeah, no, it's a very fair question. You know, something I um, you know, wanted to talk about more in terms of considerations. Uh, so first of all, I'll be clear, I'm not uh, necessarily advocating kind of uh, wholesale, unleashed uh, spending on adaptation, you know, in the absence of science. Um, but I am saying that there's already uh, some adaptation issues arising, um, and maybe not a perfect sense of uh, the severity of the issues that will arise in the future, but, um, you know, at least an emerging consensus that there will be issues in the future. Um, so when you take this to the local level of uh, what incentive do people have to act when it's expensive? Um, I don't think there's going to be a uniform response. I think what you're going to see is that localities that perceive themselves to be um, in particular danger, right, either in the, the near term or, or the medium term, are going to be more likely to act. Um, and that would be the New York example or um, regions that are affected by water supply disruptions. We're seeing a lot of um, interest in the West. Um, so I think action is going to be based um, somewhat on self-interest, right? And, but, but maybe to qualify that uh, a little bit, um, localities have been somewhat surprising, I think, uh, in the measures they've undertaken in the past 10 years. Um, so while I, I agree with you, the self-interest is there and it's a driver and you're going to see the most action where that's going to occur, um, I also think in the climate change debate, localities have emerged as leaders in some ways, um, in some ways that have been contrary to kind of bare financial self-interest. So, that answers your question. All right. Well, I'd like to invite you to join me in thanking the panelists once again for a, a brilliant panel this morning. Thank you very much.